On this episode of Mind Body Beauty, we talk all about the importance of getting a beauty sleep with Jamie Scott from Synergy Health. Hey everyone, welcome to Mind Body Beauty, helping you feel happier in your own skin. I'm Crystal, the creator of Ecology Skincare, and today I have with me the super smart Jamie Scott from the Ancestral Health Society of New Zealand and Whole Nine South Pacific. Now, Jamie is a nutritionist and a sports and exercise scientist. He's also a proud Kiwi. He's the president of the Ancestral Health Society of New Zealand and the lead researcher and content developer for Synergy Health. Jamie also loves mountain biking, a good espresso, and a good debate. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks for having me, Crystal. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've got to put my super smart glasses on just to kind of <laughs> up, up the ante a little bit. So, uh, so I, I don't normally wear glasses, but we are recording in the evening, and I think as we get into the, uh, the podcast, you'll see where the glasses come in. So. Super fancy. We'll, we'll definitely have a chat about that. Because uh, I've invited Jamie on today because I think sleep is one of the most underappreciated and one of the best things we can do for our general health and happiness and also for the health of our skin and you know it's not just when we're not getting enough sleep we get the dark circles under our eyes we get the fine lines and wrinkles becoming more pronounced and our skin looks really dull there's so much more going on under the skin from a general health and and happiness perspective so jamie when we do sleep it might seem like we're dead to the world but there's a whole lot going on under the skin can you walk us through some of the things that do happen when we're asleep? Yeah, sure. So I think, like, historically we've tended to look at sleep as if it, it is this sort of shutdown period, so basically a de- dead period for the body, eyes closed, we're dead to the world and nothing much happens. In actual fact, it's probably one of the most active states that we can be in across our, our 24-hour circadian rhythm, our 24-hour cycle that, that we have. So during this period of time uh, within the, the brain, itself the brain's going through multiple states so it's got some different uh, activity phases it, it goes through some of those are sort of very deep uh, what we call slow wave uh, phases but others are very very active and if you actually look at brain wave patterns during sleep and, and versus waking they're actually quite similar at certain certain periods during the sleep so something like our dream sleep or call REM sleep has an activity pattern in the brain that's very very close to being pretty much the same as what it is when, when we're awake Outside of uh, the brain patterns, we've got a, a whole raft of hormones which are being released during the, the sleep period. And these are hormones which generally don't get released during our, our daytime. Uh, and in particular, say something like growth hormone. Growth hormone gets its biggest uh, release period when we're, we're going through early uh, sleep early in the night. Uh, and that sets off a whole cascade of a physiological function for us so um, it's it's not it, it isn't a, a period of, of nothing happening in fact it's probably a period where if you mark the day daylight hours as our period of sort of progressive breakdown sleep becomes the period of time when we fix everything up and, and rebuild ourselves so it's a very very active time and there are there are, there are many systems and uh, as I said very many hormones that are released during that sleep time to enable that repair process to yeah, so it sounds like it'd be really important from a from a immune perspective as well, if it's our primary time for for growth and repair and maintenance. Absolutely. So if you look at uh, again, everything is kind of governed by this uh, the circadian rhythms, this twenty four hour cycle. So we go through periods where different uh, systems or different parts of our body have a, a high degree of activity versus a low degree of activity based on what's happening within this. 24 hour cycle and, and for our immune system in particular the sleep period is a period of time where our immune system kind of upregulates itself uh, part of that is because the immune system is very heavily involved in uh, tissue repair so when mm. we've when you're just kind of going through our, our day-to-day life everything's kind of breaking down so we're getting these kind of i guess in very simplistic terms minute tears and tissue muscle tissues breaking down bone tissues breaking down it's it's aging in, in, in effect this is what we sort of we, we refer to when we talk about this this thing called aging, we're kind of going through the slow breakdown. To go in and fix this tissue that is uh, basically in decline during the day, the immune system has to go in and basically gobble all the old tissue up and allow for uh, new cells to come and start regenerate some of the, the tissues that it's replacing. So it's a, it's a period of time where the immune system is very, very active. Mm. We can see 
when we are underslept or, or sleep deprived, uh, particularly in a uh, very, uh, or both in a acute and a chronic sense, we actually go through a lot of immune system suppression. So we know our immune system gets knocked flat. So there is something about sleep which allows our immune system to function very, very well and function at a, a very high level. And it was only, uh, I think it was only this week that I was reviewing a piece of research uh, that came out. And it is one of those pieces of research that kind of we've, we've probably known for a while now, but uh, it confirms that when we are under sleep, we are more susceptible to things like colds and flus. Instinctively, we probably know this. If you're, if you're burning the candle at both ends, the chances of you getting sicker are, are much, much higher. But when you see it kind of confirmed in the research, there is this very, very definite link there between uh, getting enough sleep, getting enough quality sleep, and uh, making sure our immune system is at its, at its strongest and most functional. Mm. And you mentioned uh, tissue repair as well. Um, particularly from from that immune perspective, of course, when we have skin issues, when we have those sort of micro tears and micro wounds in our skin, and when our skin barrier function is not performing the way it should, then if we're not getting enough sleep, it can have a, a big impact on on our skin as well. Especially if we have you know eczema or psoriasis or acne or any any of those other skin conditions too. Hey, absolutely. So there's a there's definitely this immune system component to many of the, the common skin conditions we, we face. So these are largely inflammatory conditions. Mm. And when we, we, we talk about inflammation, we're generally talking about our immune system being uh, quite active. And in an acute sense, that can be fantastic when you're fighting an infection. But in a very chronic sense, when your immune system's overreactive and being uh, a little bit too aggressive on certain tissues. You see this in terms of the the redness and the the inflammation and and all of the other acne and the the dry skin, the scaling. Those sorts of things tend to occur with skin that is very inflamed, which is and that inflammation again is is their immune system just doing a little bit too much work, potentially because it's being uh, it's out of sorts, maybe due to dietary influences, but certainly due to uh, sleep influences as, as, as well. Um, and you mentioned the sort of the tissue breakdown. Skin is held together by, as, as you know, um, it's got sort of uh, proteins running through it called collagen. Well, collagen will tend to break down over the course of a day, and we go through that collagen repair during the evening. We go through all our tissue repair during the evening under the influence of you know, things like growth hormone. So when we're not sleeping particularly well or we're not cycling through our sleep stages particularly well, that uh, collagen repair may suffer. So as a result of that, the integrity of the skin starts to um, decline, it starts to lose its kind of firmness and suppleness, and over time it will start to sag and, and wrinkle and everything else. And, and then as a result of perhaps not sleeping uh, enough, stress hormone levels go up. One of those stress, hormone le- uh, stress hormones is cortisol. Cortisol's uh, renowned for doing doing some very, very good things, again, in a very acute sense, but when it is chronically elevated, it starts to do things like uh, thin our skin out. So mm. it starts to really thin the layers of collagen down. One of the uh, the key issues with using a, a topical cortisol-type application, so a hydrocortisone-type cream, to deal with, say, skin inflammation, those sorts of things, is that is it your skin starts to get very thin after a period of time if you overuse that. So that's using it as as an external hormone. Well, you get exactly the same effect when it's your body's awash with it uh, internally. So, so there's all these sort of balance of hormones that, that go on between our wakeful state and our sleep state, and, and they have impact right across our, our, our body. There's no part of our body untouched by any of this, but if, if you're kind of framing it around uh, skin health, certainly there's there's major, major roles that these, these various hormones play for our skin health and all related to our sleep. Yeah, absolutely. So what can tip the balance between an, an overactive immune system and an underactive immune system? Anything and everything. Um, so it's it's a very fine balancing act for us. So in, when we're ex- exposed to an acute pathogen, say a, a cold or a flu virus or something, you, you get a cut on your skin um, and bacteria and other pathogens are, are getting through that skin barrier and entering your, your body, you want your immune system to be almost sort of overactive in that very acute stage. So in that mm. sort of first 24 to 48 hours, you want to kind of rally all your troops and go and park all your big guns at the front line and go and take those, take those pathogens out. But after that, you want the immune system to kind of subside and, and settle down. 
when it's not doing that, it can be driven by uh, obviously things like uh, lack of sleep. It can be driven heavily by by diet, so things like our uh, refined food and take refined sugars, our vegetable oils, those high omega six vegetable oils, all of those those compounds that we're exposed to, uh, all of the other environmental exposures we we have, our psychological stresses, everything else tend to drive our immune system up into this this uh, hyperactive or um, over ready state, and the immune system can get a little bit strange when it's being constantly primed like that and if it's running and, and again this is I'm being very simplistic here but if it's running out of uh, I guess pathogenic type targets to set its sights on and have a go at it can start to maybe turn its sights on our own tissues and actually start to have a go at say our skin tissue or um, it can be overactive within our lungs cause respiratory type problems or in our joints and, and and cause sort of joint type problems. So, uh, and if that ha- if that occurs long enough uh, with the the right sort of genetic background, then you start to prime the system for things like autoimmune diseases, where the immune system is now starting to attack tissues within yourself, and either in a very localized or a very generalized fashion. But the balance really sits between um, some of those key inputs, like um, getting enough sleep, making mm-hmm. sure our sleep's well timed with our circadian rhythms. Uh, making sure that we've got a, a whole foods diet that has got a good balance between our omega-6 fatty acids versus our omega-3. So they tend to kind of keep the immune system running right where it needs to be so it's not sort of too dumbed down, but it's not overactive. So all of those things have worked um, in concert together to kind of keep the immune system just sitting where it, where it needs to be. So, Jamie, you mentioned getting enough sleep. And certainly some of the research that's come through from, from a big survey in the US suggests that you know, there are around 30% of people that, that are getting six hours sleep a night or less. How much sleep should we be getting? Well, it's interesting. So that historically, uh, I, I, well, if you go out to, the, out to the street and ask uh, everyday Joe, they'll probably still give you an answer of say, oh, eight hours is supposed to be the, the magic number. That's really a, a socially constructed number and it relates back to the times where uh, everyone was encouraged to work for eight hours and, and have eight hours worth of leisure and the balance was eight hours of sleep. It's not really a biological construct. It, eight hours kind of sits nicely in the middle, I guess, of, of what the range is for human beings. Uh, most of the data for us points to somewhere between about sort of seven, seven and a half hours out through to about nine hours sleep. So uh, and, and what we've tended to do is look at that range of, say, seven and a half to nine hours and seasonally adjust it. Because we're so heavily tied to, uh, or our, our sleep cycles are so heavily tied to our light exposure, you can imagine over the summer months, particularly down at more temperate latitudes like we are here um, in, in New Zealand and certainly for where you are in Australia, the sun's coming up relatively early in the morning. It's going down quite late. So the sun, that light signal is the signal that tells you to stay awake. So over the summer months, the, the dark period of time is actually relatively short. So you'd probably shorten your sleep down quite naturally. If you took away everything to do with modern life and you just woke up when the sun came up and went to, went to bed when the sun went, sun went down, you'd probably be getting around about sort of seven, seven and a half hours sleep per night. The converse of that, particularly over the winter months, is that you should be going to bed a little bit earlier and staying asleep a little bit longer, so you're probably up more towards the nine-hour mark. So that's a, a kind of a, a rough and ready roundabout range for us. And, and certainly with the uh, Sleep Foundation, National Sleep Foundation out of the US, they've just not long, I think it was the start of this year, revised all of their sleep, uh, sleep ranges for uh, the whole lifespan, so from... Um, toddlers right through to the elderly and certainly over about age 18 uh, right through to uh, 65 plus it, it seems to be in that sort of seven and a half to nine hour nine hour range as as you as you said there people aren't aren't getting that particularly if you, if you look at say something like the u.s data which which seems to be the data we get the the most they are sitting somewhere between about the six to six and a half hour range on average uh anecdotally i I haven't seen any hard and fast numbers out of Australia and New Zealand, but just kind of anecdotally when you get to speak to people and see what sort of hours they generally keep, uh, what sort of quality of sleep they, they get, they tend to be sitting in that kind of six, six and a half hour 
range, maybe some getting through to seven, but that's still under the, the lower threshold of probably what we, sh- we should be getting. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, Jamie, with the National Association in America changing their ranges, have they made any allowances for seasonal differences? Because I know that for a lot of us, I tend to have like a, a bedtime that I tend to stick to throughout most of throughout most of the year. I don't sort of tend to, to vary it that much based on on the life cycles, but clearly that's something that we maybe should be taking into account. I think we definitely sh- we should be looking at it. Um, the, the sleep rec- recommendations that come through don't say it explicitly. Uh, I don't think anything within our current health circles looks at human beings as being a seasonal creature, even though we are we are heavily influenced by that. So if you follow through the logic that our circadian rhythm is very much tagged to uh, light and dark cycles, mm. and that we have these uh, these long uh, periods of, of daylight during the summer months, uh, we have shorter nights, and we have the the opposite during winter. It makes sense for us to vary our sleep according to that seasonal variation. Now, typically what you see with people over the summer months is that they will wake up a, a little bit earlier over the, the summer months, everything else being equal, assuming that they're not a, a shift worker or anything else there, they will wake up re- relatively early in the summer months, particularly when the first rays of light start to creep in the curtains or blinds, uh, and they, they'll actually wake up relatively easy. So let's say if you're waking up at 6 or half past 6 uh, in January, compare that to say July, you will wake up a lot, lot easier in January than you will in July. July, you will want to hide and stay under the duvet, <laughs> and, sorry, Duna, um, and, uh, and not want to get out of bed because that light signal is just, just not there. So over the summer months, we tend to be able to wake up uh, much more easily. We can stay up a little bit later, burn the candle at, at both ends, but that sleep debt that we build up over those spring and summer months, we need to repay it. If we don't repay it, if we try and keep exactly the same hours over the, the winter period, so we basically just average our year out and, and stay on a, a set period of time, you can end up with the sort of uh, what we call seasonal jet lag, where it is pitch black now at, say, 6 or half past 6 in the morning, and because it is it's pitch dark, you're not getting the light signal to stimulate your body to wake up. But the alarm clock is waking you up and the cup of coffee and the cold shower and everything else is waking you up. But hormonally, you just don't want to be awake. And it actually ends up um, advancing your circadian rhythm a a little bit and you end up in basically a state of jet lag. So uh, if we allow for the fact that uh, it's probably, say, a a 90-minute difference or a 60-minute difference between uh, peak summer and peak winter, probably even longer than longer than that. It's the equivalent of probably about two time zones difference worth of jet lag that um, you're, you're inflicting on yourself if you don't adjust for it seasonally. Wow. So in wintertime, we just need to be a little bit kinder with ourselves and, and allow ourselves to get up a bit later and maybe not go to the early morning gym class. Absolutely. So, I mean, I know it's it's difficult because we are locked into this society that, as I said, is, is pretty much averaged out across the year that society doesn't fluctuate seasonally by and by and large we still need to be at work at the, the same time it'd be nice if we could ring the boss up and say i'll be a, a little bit late today it's winter uh, but, but that ain't going to happen uh, but there are things that we can do within our life outside of work to perhaps make things um, a little bit easier on ourselves and certainly if you're someone who loves to get up uh, early in the morning on a, a gorgeous summer's morning and go for a walk or hit the gym fantastic it's probably doing it all all of the all of the good stuff but then doing that at the kind of the opposing time six months later in the middle of winter it's actually putting probably too much stress uh, on the body because you are now waking up in that jet lag state and then trying to take yourself off to engage in some sort of exercise which is a is a stressor in and of itself couple that with the fact that people generally don't go to bed earlier in the winter the winter months as well yeah means that you're now burning the candle at both ends with the seasonal jet lag overlaid on top of that and it's, it's just too much i think it cooks a lot of people yeah. um, and, and you can see the effects on people over a, over a particularly long winter yeah so what are some of the other i guess diet and lifestyle things that have crept in over the years that can really push our circadian rhythm out of whack and, and mean that we're not really respecting that daylight cycle when i went through uh my 
by training in um, human physiology. The one that was always talked about if, with any sort of reference to sleep, and, and bear in mind, 15 years ago, uh, having done uh, two degrees that had a very big physiology basis, sleep was barely touched on. So sleep wow. science is... Sleep science has really only come to the fore probably in the last decade and certainly in, in a popular standpoint in the last five years. Um, so the, the big one that was always talked about was caffeine intake. So we looked at how much caffeine we had, uh, were we being exposed to across the course of a day. Caffeine being a compound which, uh, amongst a, a couple of other effects, tends to increase cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone that wakes you up. That's that's what we produce to wake ourselves up in the morning, particularly with our exposure to daylight. So when we're drinking cups of coffee all throughout the, the day or other um, caffeine sources, we are increasing our cortisol levels to a point where we've just got this constant signal to be awake all of the time. Now, something like caffeine does take, uh, it takes a little bit of time to clear the system. Some people are, are fast caffeine metabolizers. Most people tend to be a little bit on the slower side. If we average it out, it takes you about six hours or so to get your caffeine levels down to about half of what they currently are. But if you are dosing yourself repeatedly throughout the day, you could see someone in effect hit nine o'clock at night with the equivalent of, say, um, a strong black coffee still circulating through their, their system. Wow. And that's just that's just not conducive to... Um, initiating sleep and certainly it's not conducive to allowing the body to run through its, its deep sleep so deep sleep cycles early in the night so that that was always the big focus if we jump forward to where we are now yes caffeine is still a, a problem and it's probably uh, far more available to us than what it was say sort of 10 15 years ago because the, the likes of the energy drinks were so prolific as, as what they are now the other big one on the scene in very recent years has been the blue light exposure mm. And so what we're referring to here is our modern uh, LED-style screen devices, which is our smartphones and our tablets and, and computers, which emit blue light in a wavelength, which is very, very similar to what we receive in certain receptors in our eyes from sunlight. And it's the wavelength that tells us to, to wake up. So we've got, uh, we've got specific receptors in our eyes, which have their terminal nerve endings go deep into our brain, and they go deep into the part of our brain which sets our, um, our body clock. Um, so our, our circadian rhythm. So those receptors, they don't, they don't see as we normally see stuff. They don't kind of see um, color vision or 3D vision or anything else. They just pick up the specific blue light. And again, it's exactly the blue light that our, our modern screen devices are emitting. And we, we've just got these, these devices everywhere. So I'm talking to you on, on one now. Uh, hence, hence the glasses. So I'm wearing glasses that are blocking that blue light so that I'm not getting uh, any sort of sleep-disrupting light coming out of those. Uh, all of the big screen TVs, they've got that sort of similar similar device. And probably uh, the most prolific would be our phones. And these are devices which we hold very, very close to our eyes. Mm -hmm. So we, we hold them very close to our face. Uh, and the net effect of being bombarded with this particular form of blue light in the evening is it suppresses our, our key sleep hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is kind of the opposite to cortisol. It's the one that kind of uh, sets our body up for sleep, initiates sleep. It should sort of start to come uh, or come up in our bloodstream normally about sort of a couple of hours after sundown, again, all else, uh, everything else being equal. But when we have things like these blue screen devices, a lot of homes now have uh, high efficiency LED uh, down lights, which are um, similar in the sort of blue light. It's the, the light behind me here in our house. Uh, we've got these high efficiency LEDs. So we're kind of like, we live in a fairly kind of modern uh, apartment with all the devices and all the lights. Uh, it crushes our melatonin, mm. which uh, if left unchecked or you're not doing anything to mitigate it, uh, will actually suppress your melatonin levels for potentially a, a good two to three hours. So if, if we're trying to get ourselves ready for bed at sort of nine, half past nine at night, but we're getting hit with these uh, blue light photons out of all these various uh, lights and devices, our body may not actually want to initiate the first stages of sleep until half past 11, midnight maybe thereafter. So you, you kind of get caught in that, that horrible feeling of feeling tired going to bed, but you're just lying there not able to initiate sleep. You, your eyes are closed, it's pitch dark, but you're just going, I'm just not sleeping. I'm just not falling asleep. And you feel quite restless. Yeah. So, you know, that those I guess between those two lifestyle factors, 
they're the two big ones. So the, the, the blue light uh, exposure from our screens, the, the caffeine intake that we have during the, the day. And then you've got all the other factors in there. So uh, stress. Stress is a, a potent stimulator of cortisol. Cortisol always wins the arm wrestle between uh, itself and melatonin. It's a, it's a stress hormone. It's a survival hormone. Uh, you go back to our hunter-gatherer days, and if a, a, you know, a large animal suddenly decides to pounce on you just as you're going to about fall asleep, the last thing you want to be able to do is turn around to the, the big cat and go, sorry, not now, mate. I'm, a, I'm, I'm having a snooze come back in the morning. Uh, you, you want all of your survival hormones to kind of come up and, yeah, and yeah. kick in and suppress your, suppress your sleep hormones. And that's exactly what happens in our, our, our modern world. So we've got stressful jobs. We've got stressful commutes in our cars. All of those things add up. Financial stresses, they, they all crush our, our sleep to a certain degree. Um, and then these highly refined diets, they all have various effects on uh, our internal systems, whether it's a low-level, undiagnosed or unrecognized, uh, say, food allergy. So something like uh, someone eating, uh, say, gluten when they're a, a, an undiagnosed celiac, they're actually getting a low-level stress response to that um, basically dietary allergen that they're, they're being exposed to. And when you've got these sort of low-level stress responses to certain uh, certain dietary components they will interfere with your your sleep and and i've worked with uh, any number of people who when you've cleaned up their diet and taken out some of the things that they were perhaps a little bit reactive to they suddenly say oh i'm sleeping fantastically this is the first good night's sleep i've had in a long time uh sugar sugar tends to play around with cortisol levels when we're chronically exposed to it so there's really not a lot in our very modern lifestyle that doesn't impact on our sleep. We often measure our sleep by the time we're sleeping and would say, well, I've, I've always been sleeping seven hours and that hasn't really changed. It's really the, the quality of that sleep that gets hammered by a lot of these sorts of sorts of things. So uh, we have to go through very set phases during the night and, and many of these things that we're exposed to, you know, be it the light, be it the diet, be it the, the stresses, they interfere with those phases and you can be getting six hours, seven hours, you can be getting nine hours, you can be getting 10 hours sleep a night and still wake up the next morning just feeling absolutely hammered if you haven't gone through these set phases. Yeah, wow. So how important is it that we um, that we get more sleep before midnight? Because there's that saying that, you know, an hour before midnight is worth two hours after midnight. So mm. are, are there more important sleep phases that we go through before midnight? Yeah, like there's always all these... Um, these old sayings and old wives' tales, but I think out of out of a lot of them that are out there, it's probably one that's got the majority of truth sitting in it. If you look at how we would have slept again with our our largest evolutionary environment, which it would have been sort of um, you know, for us in, in the sleep sense, probably only up to about a hundred fifty odd years ago, maybe up to two hundred years ago, prior to electricity uh, and large amounts of light we were kind of forced to go to bed it's like everything's pitch dark your hormones kick in and there's not a whole lot you can do about it so you can imagine in various points in the world at the stage that that darkness kicks in and assuming that we would have entered some sort of sleep stage maybe two to three hours after darkness at the latest that's probably going to be around about nine ten o'clock for the for the most part that we're starting to go into our, our first stages of sleep. Now, during our first stages of sleep, during the first three hours of sleep, this is where we go through our deepest uh, stages. So we go, we sleep in 90-minute blocks. We string two 90-minute blocks together within the first three hours. And during that first three hours, we get our largest growth hormone pulse. So this is the hormone which starts to direct all of the, repair, the tissue repair and regeneration process. So it's a very, very critical time. You, if you can... If you could divide sleep into two distinct blocks, it seems to be that this first period of sleep we go through is very much our physical repair. And then the second, the later stages uh, would be probably more related to psychological um, re repair. So very, very simply. So if you look at it from that historical context, we were going to bed probably you know, two to three hours before midnight, having a good three hours worth of deep sleep. And then it seems to be that we actually woke up for a period of time. So we may have been awake for anything up to a couple of hours right in the, the wee small hours of the night, which was a 
uh, I've heard it described as a very sort of calm, semi-trance-like kind of state, you know, where we, you know, we were active, but not obviously doing a, a massive amount. Uh, and then we'd go back through this sort of second cycle of, of sleep uh, earlier in the morning. And so this is uh, this is this what we call polyphasic sleep pattern rather than one uh, very sort of consolidated block. So when you when you hear the word uh, midnight and look at that in terms of normal hormone, uh, sleep hormonal responses, all of our peak sleep hormone responses occur in and around sort of midnight. So they're in that sort of hour or so either side of it. What you see now in modern human beings is that their their midnight, so the middle of their night hormonally, is actually probably closer to about three or four o'clock in the morning. Mm. So where we've dialed ourselves around too far one way. So our middle of our sleep, our midnight is around about 12 o'clock at night. And that means that we should be getting maybe an hour or so deep consolidated sleep prior to that and maybe another hour and hour or so after that, so hour and, a, hour and a half either side of that. If you miss that block, let's say, let's say you're still up at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning kind of partying up in the club, chances are is that you will miss that deep sleep block altogether or it will get advanced and messed up and, and disturbed by the alarm clock in the morning. So, yeah. um, so I, I think one of the, you know, we, we always kind of bemoan the fact that we need to get out of bed far too early and it's always hard to kind of do it. We get woken up by alarm clocks. People are focusing at the wrong end of the night as far as their sleep goes. What we try and encourage is for people to wind themselves down sufficiently early in the evening so that they can actually get to bed and get that really deep restorative sleep that occurs between about, 10, half past 10, 11 o'clock and through to 1, 2 o'clock in the morning for most people. Yeah. So you mentioned the um, the, the orange lens blue block of glasses that you're wearing as, as one of the things that you can do to help yourself wind down um, mm-hmm. before bed and, and make sure that you get that, that really high quality restorative deep sleep in the first, that first period. What are some of the other things that we can do to help wind ourselves down and to make sure that we get that good quality sleep? Yeah, sure. I run uh, sleep uh, presentations for the, the uh, corporate wellness or uh, workplace wellness um, company that I work for, and when I get uh, when I get asked this question, people kind of always sort of go back a little bit because they say that your sleep preparation starts as soon as you wake up in the morning. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the hormonal environment that we need to curate in order to initiate really good quality deep sleep starts basically as soon as we open our eyes that morning. And it starts with things like getting that good bright light exposure as early as we can. Now I know that's a that's often a challenge, you know, when we are down in kind of um, fairly deep latitudes in the middle of winter. But try and get that good bright light exposure as as soon as we can because that gives our body an anchor point. Um, it stimulates the, the the proper circadian rhythm so that the hormone that keeps us or wakes us up comes up at the right time. But it also means that it's tracked through its normal period of time and then the hormone that puts us to sleep comes up at the right time as well. If we're not getting that bright light exposure early and not perhaps not getting it until much later in the, the day or much later in the morning at least, it pushes everything sideways so that now your sleep hormone is not available to you at the time that you would like to initiate sleep. It's being pushed you know, closer to midnight, closer to one o'clock in the morning. So that starts there. Um, your sleep hormones are made out of uh, the protein that you eat. Uh, so they're all um, derived from amino acids that you digest from your foods. And there are particular amino acids which lend themselves uh, more to those sleep hormones. And one in particular is uh, an amino acid called tryptophan. Most of our modern cereal foods that most people will be having for breakfast, so your, you know, all your corn flakes and rice bubbles and, and breads and bagels and everything else, the you know, standard stuff that most people are probably having for breakfast, those are actually quite low in tryptophan. Uh, and they will tend to steal or uh, move amino acids around your body in ways that make it pretty much unavailable. So a really good experiment that was done on Japanese school children, I think last year or the year before, they showed that by giving them a very uh, tryptophan-rich breakfast, which was something like eggs, so basically any sort of animal protein is very tryptophan-rich, uh, showed that they were able to manufacture more melatonin in their bodies and initiate better sleep earlier on uh, 
uh, as a result of that high protein breakfast. So already, so your, your two key strategies are wake up, get bright light in the eyes and have a really good protein breakfast. Uh, and that basically sets you up uh, right throughout the day. Uh, things like uh, being very cautious around your uh, caffeine intake, obviously. I'm pretty relaxed around uh, coffee intake, as you know. <laughs> um, a little bit too relaxed, perhaps. Unless people are very, very sensitive to, to caffeine. I really don't think caffeine has a massive impact during the morning when our cortisol levels are quite naturally high anyway. Uh, after about 2, you know, two 3 o'clock in the afternoon at the absolute latest, I think you're, you, if you still have a strong caffeine intake after that point, you're probably starting to run into trouble because you do need that sort of six or seven hours to metabolise a good portion of that caffeine. So like, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with people having coffee up until about lunchtime, but then you'd, you'd decaffeinate yourself uh, after, after that point. Uh, continue your bright light exposure throughout the day because that, um, that helps keep your melatonin levels low. We often find uh, often uh, office workers who don't have a lot of natural light within their office. So let's say they're in a part of the building that's uh, away from windows or they actually might be in a part of a, a building that has no windows. Um, people who work in malls are a good example of that. Mm. They don't get any natural light exposure working in the middle of a mall. So what you find, because they don't have any bright sunlight exposure during the day, their melatonin levels are actually starting to creep back up. And you see these people, they look tired, they're yawning and, and everything else. Uh, so now their melatonin is high at two o'clock in the morning instead of nine o'clock. Uh, sorry, two o'clock in the afternoon instead of nine o'clock at night. So they they've got this funny circadian rhythm shift going on, uh, and then things like watching your stress level. So when you you leave work and maybe you're stuck in a a, a bad commute home, just trying to relax as as much as you can, not trying to hype yourself up, um, you know, not listening to all of the disasters on the news or coming home and picking a fight with the kids or the partner or whoever, like all of that sort of stuff, which adds to your stress levels, because again, those evening stresses, they will just knock your melatonin levels flat. And then obviously engaging in any sort of blue screen device activity, trying to kind of keep it pretty low key, uh, not deciding that at half past nine at night, someone is wrong on the internet and you need to write a 3,000 word essay as, as to why that is. Uh, because you know, one, you're getting the, the blue blue light, and two, you're probably getting pretty wound up by that person. <laughs> I, I'm not speaking from personal experience. <laughs> I, I've I've never done that. So like all of the, and all of those things add up. So that's you, you can't you can't curate good sleep by going. Oh, it's ten o'clock. I should jump into bed now. Right. So it it just doesn't work that way. It's such a such a, it's a process that's very very heavily influenced from the time that you you wake up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know for myself, I, I have a wake up light. So in terms of how you wake up as well, if you've got an alarm clock that sort of is going rah, 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 first thing in the morning or, you know, you're listening to inane banter on morning <laughs> morning radio stations, you know, that can sort of, you know, push you into that fight flight mode first thing in the morning and, and really get things wound up like at a higher level than it should. Yeah, we, we haven't used uh, an audible alarm clock with, with the exception of the occasional morning where one of us might need to be up early, so occasionally I'll, I'll have to get a, an early flight. So I, I don't trust myself to, um, <laughs> to just rely on the, the light alarm clock, but, so I'll use an audible alarm clock then. But we haven't used one as a, a regular wake-up call for well, probably two or three years. Mm. And it's, it's the best way in the world to wake up, just that sort of gen gentle light. And it is a good, and I hate using this term, um, term hack, but it is a good kind of biohack, for want of a better term, uh, for those who are at those temperate latitudes, such as we are in the middle of winter, where you do, you can't do anything about light exposure. So the only way around it is to really have one of these these bedside lights, which uh, the way they work is that they sort of uh, you they say you set it for now it's set for seven o'clock most mornings. So it'll start to give. Uh, give you a very gentle light from about 6.30 onwards and be at peak brightness at 7 o'clock. And, and typically I will be awake and ready to go by about sort of 5, five to 7 with those. So, um, and it, it, it beats the pants off radio alarm clocks and audible alarm clocks and kookaburras doing this at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Although kookaburras are okay. That was a semi-natural way to wake up. But. <laughs> 
And um, so, Jamie, what are your thoughts on on blackout blinds? Because obviously that can prevent morning light coming in through coming in through the windows, but it can really block out, you know, street lights and um, street lights basically that that might be interfering with your your melatonin production as well. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting thing. So, like I recall, and, and just any, there could have been any number of factors at, at play here. I used to be someone in my teens and probably through to my late twenties. I could fall asleep with the curtains open. Like you could have all sorts of light streaming through, and I'd be boom, boom, dead. Uh, but as I've probably a cleaned my life up a little bit so that I don't fall unconscious or don't require to fall unconscious as much as what I used to. Um, and two, become probably a little bit more sensitive to a lot of those stimulating factors, caffeine included, actually. I can't, uh, I can't drink coffee anywhere near as late as what I used to be. Things like even the, a fraction of light sneaking in around the blinds can be quite disturbing, particularly when you've got some of those other factors lined up. So let's say you are already stressed about something or, uh, in, in my instance, let's say I know I have to be up at half past four in the morning to catch an early flight up to Auckland. Any sort of fraction of light that my eyes want to lock onto, even with my eyelids shut, it will tend to do that and it will tend to disrupt my sleep initiation and going into that, that deep sleep. So I think blocking all of that light out, which often necessitates using um, blackout blinds, uh, or and I've, I've seen all sorts of DIY versions uh, of this, of duct tape and tin foil, and, you basically, and for shift workers it's gold. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 one of the good strategies to use for shift workers. I think it's a really good thing to to do is to look at your sleep environment, to look at those light sources, so things creeping in from outside of the bedroom into the bedroom, but also some of the light sources that you already have in your bedroom. So we have things like everything's got a bloody LED standby light on it these days. That is enough in a dark room. A very bright blue LED or bright green LED, it's often enough to be quite disturbing to someone who's already a little bit broken in their sleep and, and um, sensitive to that anyway. So get rid of any gadget that has a, an LED on it. Phones that have bloody notification lights and all sorts of that have to get, it, get them out of the room. They don't need to be there. Uh, if you do have an alarm clock and need an alarm clock, put it on the floor, under the bed, duct tape the the display off do whatever you need to to get that light out of your eye certainly it shouldn't be on uh, a bedside cabinet which sits at eye level and is probably less than 30 centimeters away from your eyes that's that's crazy so you get rid of all of that sort of stuff that's uh that's crucial so you're really minimizing that that light environment and going into sort of a, a pitch black environment yes the trade-off might be that perhaps it's a little bit harder to wake up in the morning but i think in the grand scheme of things, if you get the sleep initiation right, if you go through good solid, solid sleep cycles across the night, you'll probably still be able to wake up relatively okay. And then your strategy in the morning is as soon as your alarm or whatever goes off is that you go and pull the blinds, even if it's just a fraction, to let some light flood back in, even if that means you're jumping back into bed to kind of snooze for another five or so minutes while you let that light wash into the, into the eyes. So we'll, we'll often do that in our, our bedroom. I'll go and just lift the blind up a little bit more to flood the room with a bit more lights uh, first thing and then climb back into bed and spark out for another 10 minutes. <laughs> Beautiful. That all sounds like um, really, really good strategies. So thank you, Jamie. Now, you have got coming up very, very soon an Ancestral Health Society Symposium. You've just got to blow my stress levels. <laughs> Trying to try keep it calm. <laughs> yes, we have. Beautiful. And that's in Queenstown, the beautiful Queenstown in New Zealand. So uh, in the end of October, we've got uh, this Ancestral Health Society International Symposium. Uh, near enough 30 speakers from uh, all over the place, North America, UK, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, I think we've snuck a couple of Canadians uh, in there somewhere. Um so yeah, it's going to be fantastic covering a whole heap of uh, topics. So all, all the usual stuff for a health symposium, diet, exercise, uh, but a few different things in there as well in terms of uh, a very strong emphasis on behaviour change. So just uh, looking at some of the things that really drive us to make some of the, the decisions that we do and how we can uh, reject those. And some really kind of important big picture stuff, 
uh, climate change, urban environment development, how we do our transport systems, uh, mental health, Maori ecology, heaps and heaps of stuff. So really, really diverse range of uh, speakers. Yeah, it sounds really awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, yes, for you coming over. Yeah. And at the risk of driving those quarters all over Zap a little further, what are you going to be talking on, Jamie? Uh, what I have yet to write a presentation on. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking at the developmental origins of health and disease. So if we look at public health focus, it's very heavily weighted towards screening adults typically from their middle age onwards for all sorts of diseases to try and prevent those diseases occurring or to try and minimise uh, their their occurrence, particularly in our, our later years. So we, and as you can imagine, we've got a, an ageing population, so we've got a lot more people going through those screening processes. If you look at the effect of some of those, it's kind of fairly debatable as to how effective they are if you measure it just by uh, time gained in good health towards the end of our life. So you're really measuring them, and some of them you're actually measuring them literally in weeks to months in terms of what you're gaining uh, from some of those those health strategies. At the other end of our lifespan, we seem our, our life trajectories in terms of our health and disease are very, very heavily influenced by uh, this periconceptual environment. So what your mother and father were living like in terms of their lifestyle before you were even a glint in your father's eye. So um, through to two years of age. So that sort of periconceptual environment and, and even you know, right through to what your, how your grandparents lived, what they were exposed to, that periconceptual environment has the ability to condition or set a certain trajectory Pro- programming is too strong a word it doesn't program us for a certain outcome later on but it can set us on a trajectory in our life where perhaps we are more susceptible to certain things um, and that could be uh, that we become more susceptible to developing pathological type conditions uh, diabetes certain cancers uh, and so on and so forth Or it could be that that periconceptual environment is actually sending a signal to the developing child that it's going to be born into a specific type of environment. So it's some of the signals that we have in the modern world may send a very confusing signal to a developing fetus to say, hey, you might be born into a a world where the available nutrition is very, very low. So if you've got a uh, a society or a, 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 you know, mothers consuming a, a very highly processed diet, whereas there's not a lot of nutrition sits within that diet, that will send a signal to the developing fetus, hey, there's not, there's not a lot of nutrition out in this, this real world. Let's kind of re-gear your system a little bit to give you a bit more resilience against that, which may mean that that child, when he or she does eat, is that they're more likely to store that food is, is energy, so store a bit more body fat, make a few other adjustments uh, in their life. And so if we want to enact a circuit breaker on where we're at in society, where each generation after generation seems to be developing all of these modern morbidities at an earlier stage, you know, from you know, 60s a couple of generations ago to 40s now to 20s and 30s probably in the, the coming generations, if we want to break that cycle we can't do it by screening someone in their 40s for a certain disease. It's like their past reproductive age, you know, all of those things have been, all of those trajectories have been set. So let's let's have a look at the other end of the lifespan and say, is there something we can do there? And it seems to be that there, there probably is. And that's not that's not to say that what we do is then just go to all the mums out there and go, sorry, mums, you have to eat better. It's, it's, not, it's not a simple strategy like that, but it's about uh, giving younger kids better education about their own biology so that they know what are the, the influences on on their biology uh, shortening up some of the inequalities that we have in society so that the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots is, is is much shorter because we know that that can lead to adverse outcomes we know that a good portion of pregnancies are not planned they are accidental and when they're accidental it's very hard to kind of set this periconceptual environment so we need a lot of education around reproductive strategies and all those sorts of things. Mm. So, so it's kind of it's wrapped up in that, and it's, it's just kind of planting the seed, I guess, that as a society, we may need to 
accept that we spend less of our health dollar on ourselves as individuals, you know, when we're 40 plus, 50 plus, 60 plus, and actually invest that money at the other end into the two-year-olds, the 10-year-olds, and the 15 to 25-year-olds, particularly the, the women on, on that front. That'll be a hard shift for society, but you've, you've got to kind of stick that information out there and, and plant the seed and, and see what they want. So, so I've got four weeks to kind of wrap that up into a 20-minute <laughs> <laughs> No well, stress. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of great ideas there, for sure. And, and it will get a lot of people thinking. It will, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for coming and sharing your your knowledge and your expertise with us today. So, you know, there are a few places where you pop up online. If we're wanting to um, to come and, and read more of your your musings online, where can we find you? Uh, for reading 140 character rants, <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, underscore Jamie underscore Scott. Uh, if you want to read something that's got a little bit more thought and construction and is tempered down a little bit, um, our blog is uh, reevolutionary.com or the Ancestral Health Society website, which is kind of a whole range of people. So yeah. uh, look up and, and Ancestral Health Society of New Zealand and that, that'll, uh, the Google machine will take you there. Awesome. And we'll put the links in the show notes as well. So thank you everyone for joining us for Mind Body Beauty today. If you like this episode, please subscribe so you can have future episodes coming straight to you. And please, you know, like, share, and come and tell us on social media. Come and find us on social media. Tell us what you've done to help improve your own sleep. So until next time, thank you very much.